I know a friend who's a seminary professor, and he told me one time he was lecturing on the greatness and the majesty of God. He said, I was really into it. I was passionately laying out this awesome verbal picture of just who God is. And then serendipitously and suddenly the class interrupted my lecture and broke out in the doxology. Well, that's exactly what we're going to see the Apostle Paul do this morning as we come to the end of Romans chapter 11. Paul looks back over those 11 chapters, how he's laid out the greatness, the majesty of Almighty God. And suddenly we see him this morning break forth into a glorious hymn of praise. Let's take a look. Turn with me in your Bibles or look up on the screen. Uh, We're looking at verses 33 through 36 of Romans 11 this morning. Let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now hear God's word, beginning to read at verse 33 of Romans chapter 11. 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him And to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I can only imagine that one of the hardest things about being an atheist is when you have one of those moments in life those inevitable moments in life when, out of the blue, suddenly comes welling up within you just an overwhelming sense of joy and thankfulness. But if you're an atheist, you don't know where it came from and you don't know who to direct it toward. Well, the Apostle Paul has no trouble doing that this morning. Over the last 11 chapters of Romans, he has meticulously spread over those chapters this majestic picture of just who God is, and it culminates in the gospel of grace, that sin is real and has separated humanity with an infinite chasm from Almighty God. And there's absolutely nothing that human beings can do in and of themselves to bridge that chasm. In fact, all of humanity has put itself on a highway to hell of their own self-destruction. But God, but God in his unconditional love comes into time and space in the person of Jesus, the God-man, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Savior, the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. And when Jesus comes into time and space, Paul has laid out for us, he did that to accomplish on the cross what humanity could not do for itself. And that's to make the once for all sufficient, perfect sacrifice that covers and pays for all the sin of those whom God has elected, chosen, predestined before the foundation of the world. In other words, God's plan of salvation is all of God, none of us. It is all Sheer, sheer grace. It has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with, I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. That is not the gospel, my friends. And there's one of two reactions that you and I can have when we are confronted with the gospel of God's electing grace. We can go, are you kidding me? I don't believe that. That's preposterous. I don't like it. I don't like that kind of God. Is there anybody else up there? Or the second response is, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Romans 1 through 11 are totally, totally doctrinal. Paul meticulously painting this picture 
of just who God is and what he's done to draw you and me back to himself in Jesus Christ. Now, next week we're going to begin chapter 12, and the rest of Romans 12 through 16 is all about practical stuff on how to follow the living Lord Jesus. Now, American Christians pretty much prefer the practical stuff rather than doctrine. And that's one of the reasons, my friend, maybe it's the major reason, that 88% of American churches are currently stagnant are in decline. Because yours and my confidence in the gospel, the depth of joy and hope in your lives and in mine, is directly proportional to the picture or how big the picture we have is of God. Small picture of God, you're going you're gonna to be going through life like this. The bigger your picture of God, the more on fire and passionate you're going to be about following Christ. But most pastors and most churches today major in the practical, you know, helpful hints for harmful habits. That stuff does you no good if you've got a small picture of God. Well, Paul has worked overtime in these 11 chapters to lay out a big, big, big picture of God. In fact, in so many words, he's saying, I've only scratched the surface. This God is so much more infinitely supreme and wonderful and majestic and loving. You can't get your brain around it. How big, just how big is your picture of God? If you've never read it, do yourself a favor, stretch your mind, deepen your soul, and get a copy of J.B. Phillips' classic, Your God is Too Small. Your God is, you can get it at any Christian bookstore, Google it online, you can get it. Your God is Too Small. One of my covenant brothers in my national covenant group is Mark Laberton, and Mark's the president of Fuller Seminary out in California. I remember Mark telling me about how he became a Christian. It was late in his college years, and he accepted Christ and went home and told his parents, and his dad was a non-believer, his dad was an engineer, rational, rationalistic, I should say, and he thought this was the worst thing that ever happened to his son, who was going to Cal, Berkeley, one of the great schools, and now what's going to happen to my son? Well, the same thing that happens to all Christians. Their view of the majesty of the world gets shrunk into some petty dogma. Well, Mark's mother was a believer, and she shared with her pastor that her son had become a Christian. So the pastor, out of the blue, shows up at Mark's house, and he pulls Mark aside, and he, he tells him three things. Number one, well, I'm glad you became a Christian. Number two, you know what? This means you might be a pastor one day. And thirdly, if you do become a pastor, be sure it's in a denomination that has a really, really good pension plan. <laughs> Mark's father's worst nightmare, that's, this guy did it. Taking the majesty of becoming a believer in Jesus Christ and shrinking it down to pension plans. But you know what? The Holy Spirit, Mark says, took that and turned it for good. Because Mark said, from that moment on, I determined never to believe a petty or a small gospel or, or, or follow a small God. And, and Mark always reminds us in our covenant group, you know, it's not about us. It's not about our churches. It's about the kingdom of God, which is bigger. And if you're not ready to give your life to something bigger than yourself or some organization, you're never really going to find joy and hope and fulfillment in this life. At the turn of the 19th, 20th century, there was a whole lot of theology flowing into Europe, and it was starting to flow in America from Germany. It's classically called 19th century liberalism. And the 19th century liberalists were going after the people that were biblically, biblically orthodox and saying, you guys got a, a truncated picture of who God is, and we're on to new stuff. And we're hearing that today from people that call themselves progressives. Fortunately, God raised up on the scene a man who, if you've never read his stuff, it is so good. You hear me quote him all the time. 
It's not C.S. Lewis. And uh, this guy wrote a book to counter these folks. Get a copy of it. It's a classic. It's always in print. You can get it. It's a real easy read. But you're going to find yourself rereading sentences two or three times. Not because they're opaque and hard to understand, but you're going to go, I can't believe a human being can take a sentence and, and, and make it sing with who God is. And that author is G.K. Chesterton. And the book is called Orthodoxy. What a title. But this book sings, folks. And his whole point of the book is you'll never have a big picture of God with liberal or progressive theology. That truncates God. It's the God you and I meet in Scripture. When you're biblically orthodox, that blows the windows and the doors off of your concept of the universe and just who Almighty God is. And so Paul launches into this hymn of faith in verse 33. He's been looking back at this picture that God has revealed to him of who he really is. And Paul suddenly breaks out in verse 33 in this glorious hymn of praise. But then in verses 34 and 35, he changes tune and he goes with the tune of Isaiah. If you look at those two verses, you'll see Isaiah pops in on the scene and tries to stretch your and my minds and deepen our souls by asking three rhetorical questions. First one is, is who can completely know the mind of God? In other words, who's smarter, God or us? Second his, uh, rhetorical question, who does God take advice from? Well, Lord, I'm here 24-7, always ready, willing, and able to tell you how you ought to be running the universe. Third rhetorical question, who does God owe anything to? Well, my friends, the answer to all three questions is a big fat nobody. No one. If you think you're smarter than God, think again. If you think God needs your advice, think again. If you think God owes you something, hey, aren't we, don't we all have spiritual entitlements coming to us? Huh? <laughs> think again. Today is Trinity Sunday. Now, who in the world can figure out the Holy Trinity? When I was in seminary, I helped lead a Young Life Club in Richmond, Virginia. And our music leader was a guy who had grown up Jewish, and now he was a Christian, and worshipped at the same church I did, Takahoe Presbyterian Church. And one day I asked him, I said, Leo, how did you become a Christian? He said, well, I was in the Navy, and I was being witnessed to all the time by all these guys on board ship. But I was a good Jew. And I knew the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, one, one. These Christians, they worship three gods. I'm not going there. And so he said, I, I never even got close to becoming Christian. But I said, Leo, you are now. What happened? He said, well, I, I went to sleep one night in my bunk on the ship and had a dream. And in the dream, Jesus appeared to me and he explained to me the Trinity. And I woke up, that barrier was gone. I gave my life to Christ. I was sitting there salivating. I thought, oh, right. Here I am in seminary and I've run into somebody that can explain how the Trinity works to me. I said, Leah, explain the Trinity to me. She said, I can't. He said, I don't remember anything Jesus said. I just know it was okay. <laughs> and so I'm a Christian. I, I mean, if you can't figure out the Trinity, I have people come to me all the time saying, I'm not sure I can believe because the Trinity, uh, how does it work? Blah, blah, blah. Rather than that, shake your faith. Look at it this way. The triune, three in one, one in three personhood of God is far more vast than any of us can get our minds around. That's a great thing. That ought to cause you and me to well up with praise and thanksgiving. Do you want God to only be as big as you are, understandable to what you can figure out? I don't. I want a big God. A big God. And that's what the Trinity gives us. A big, big God. And Paul goes on in verse 36 to lay out this even bigger picture of God when he says, everything, everything in the whole universe, 
is from him. And everything is through him. That means everything that's ever happened is happening and ever will happen is through him. Uh, wait a minute, Ron. If that's true, what about all the bad stuff? Fair question. Let me tell you the good news about the bad stuff. And I don't say this from an ivory tower. I say it as a dad who's buried one kid and gone through cancer with another. Everything, the worst of the worst, that happens to you and me only comes into our lives. God only allows it into our lives because it's first passed through his fingers. Fingers that have been nailed to a cross. Fingers that mysteriously and omnipotently can take the worst of the worst and redeem that stuff ultimately to our best and even more importantly to his glory. And then Paul says in verse 36, and everything is to him. That means the destiny, the ultimate culmination of everything, it has to culminate in the glory of God. And then Paul bursts forth to end, end, end our text with glory to him forever. Amen. How big is your God? A big God is involved in and excited about and intricately weaving his omnipotent fingers into both the great things in your lives and mine and in the mundane, trivial things. That's how only a big God can do that. Eric Little, Scottish three gold medal winner at the 1924 Paris Olympics, who goes on to be a missionary in China and dies in China. Eric Little was famous for saying, God has made me fat. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. You see, Eric Little had figured out that what was most passionate about his life, what was great about his life, could be lived out as a doxology of praise to God. John Piper, who's a really good theologian, has an article. You can Google it. It's real short, really neat title. Drinking orange juice to the glory of God. Piper's point is this. You know when you pour a glass of orange juice in the morning for your breakfast? You can use that to wash down your toast. Or you can intentionally savor the flavor and the texture of the pulp. And think about who designed this. And you can drink orange juice to the glory of God. We can do anything in our lives as a doxological act of praise to God. George Washington Carver was a man who was sold out to Jesus Christ. He lived his life as a, as a doxological living praise to, to God. George, George Washington Carver found out 255 ways that you could use the peanut. Talk about trivial. But he changed the world. And somebody once asked him, how did you figure out all those things that you can do with a peanut? And Carver said, well, it all started on a day when I was walking in the fields, and the Lord and I were having a long conversation. And I said, Lord, tell me exactly why you created the universe. And the Lord said, ah, much too big a question for you to understand better come at me with something else. So he says, I walked along and I said, Lord, tell me why you created the world. And the Lord said, nope, still too big. Try again. And Carver says, I walked along a little bit more. Then I stopped, looked down at my feet, and there was a peanut vine on the ground with one little solitary peanut on it. And so I said, Lord, can you tell me why you created the peanut. 
And the Lord said, now that's a good question. That's on your level. And Carver said, the Lord then shared with him the secrets of the peanut. And the rest is history. Change the world. Look at your life. Take a good hard look at your life. And look at the world around you. Your family, your friends. All the grace and love and redemption that God has literally dumped into your life. Look at the cross. And think about the fact that Jesus went to that cross to secure your ultimate eternal life in him. That because he went there, as Paul has already said in Romans 8, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you and me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That because he went there, as you and I approach the end of our lives, we see that horizon getting closer and closer. Remember, that horizon opens up into the most vast life eternal in the unveiled glorious presence of Jesus Christ that, that words could fail to capture. Are you thinking about this thing? Do, do, are, are you like me feeling something welling up inside of you right now? Some praise and thanksgiving? Hit it, Kevin. <laughs> Stand, let's sing the doxology just robustly with passion and joy. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God now and forever in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.